How you doing? Okay, let's go with part two. So in part two, let's go and figure out what the heck we're supposed to be doing. So we're going to go back to the Blackboard site, and I've got the group project thingy open already. Remember, this is a folder that's inside of your normal Blackboard site. And so we'll scroll down here, and there we go. Section two, ecology. Fantastic. Okay, and so the point of this one is that it's mostly going to be a literature review. But I thought for this version of the project, so like my new revamped project, I would try and give you a little more guidance and try and make uh, you know a couple more milestones that you should hit so that you have a better idea of exactly what to do in order to do a good job and how to get from the start to the end. So let's do this. And yeah. Uh, we'll start with Google Scholar, so that's fine. And so for Google Scholar, you're going to want to put in the genus, but not the species of your thing. So my uh, full name is Paragaceocrinus, T-A-R-R-I, but that's the genus and the species, genus Paragaceocrinus, species teri. And so we're going to take off the second name, and we're just going to have the genus. And then we're going to search that, and bam, it's going to give you these exact pages, because that's what I just did. All right, and so on this, what we're looking for are things like ecology. And so I got lucky. I managed to hit one right at the beginning. And, ooh, look at that. Uh, stemless crowns is environmental indices. Yeah, I like to look at that. So we can click on this one. Um, have a look. If you have a little link over here, that'll take it to you. Uh, take you to a free version of this thing usually. And there are some of these that you can get when you're on campus, but not necessarily when you're off campus. I know JSTOR works on campus. I'm not sure if it works off campus. Um, and here, let's go to this guy. And we can just keep looking down. So that's a relative Agaseocrinus. Um, but it's not our crinoid. So if we had to, we could go there, but let's see if we can get a little bit better. Oh, okay, uh, more in Strimple. Yeah, that's one that we actually have uh, online. And then we can keep going. Your best result may not be on the front page, so you gotta keep going through. And so here we've got something that we're comparing to Paragaceocrinus, but look, it has a different name. So, okay, that's interesting. And so you're going to go through all of these uh, papers, and you may have to go through like 10 of them to figure out what you want. I think I got lucky on the uh, first one or two. So here is that uh, first paper, Systematics, Phylogeny, and Ecology. So phylogeny is who it's related to and why. Systematics are, um, I believe that is uh, going through exactly how it's related to other things and what phylum and kingdom and whatever it belongs to. And then ecology, that's fine, that's easy, that's like where it lives, what it did for a living, that sort of thing. And so, bam, at this point it becomes kind of like a book report, and so that's going to be your job. And so here we're talking about not only our one, but also look at all these other ones, Calciculus, Asymmetricus, Teri, and again the P is going to be the abbreviation for our genus. That's a little trick that you can do as well. Um, if it's written out the first time, then after that you can abbreviate it as just the first letter and a uh, period. And so this is great. We're going to be comparing a whole bunch of different relatives. And uh, yeah, they'll probably be similar, but maybe not. And so then at this point, it becomes your job to read the paper and go through and look up words that you don't understand. I'm going to start out by going through the figures. I think that's the best way to approach a scientific paper is by looking at what they're showing you and critically assessing it. So let's start with this one, text figure number one, schematic drawing of Paragaceocrinus in its probable life mode. Oh, that's interesting. So it's showing it about halfway buried in the dirt. And uh, incidentally, this bottom little part here, that is the only part that we actually had in our fossil. But this is showing what they think the rest of the critter would have looked like. So we had arms that laid out, something like that. And you know what? If you get one of these um, and it happens to show uh, a nice picture like this, that's golden and you got really lucky. <laughs> so we got lucky in this one. You may not have this. You may have to put it together from... Um, from description. So for descriptions, you're going to be looking like uh, life mode, okay, da 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 da, probably lived a semi infaunal life mode. So, um, and that should be semi, uh, S E M I, that may be written by somebody in a different country, who knows, or it may be a typo. Um, anyway, infaunal means uh, buried, like uh, stuck in the dirt on the bottom of the sea, 
uh, semi infaunal means about a halfway buried, and so there you go. That's exactly what we've got. And you got a neat little location map showing. Okay, this is where all the paragacy of Crinus occurs in the United States. Interesting thing: the time when uh, paragacy of Crinus lived, the equator ran right from about here, from the southern tip of Texas, right up through the top corner of uh, Pennsylvania. And they continued on through uh, things like, uh, it ran a little south of Greenland, but it ran right through Spain uh, and through uh, and on through Russia. So all those continents were a little bit differently aligned back in the Carboniferous uh, and the Pennsylvanian part, which is where ours is from. And so here on, you can read about all these things, and you're going to put together a little book report about these. So it's showing you where all these have been found. And let's see, ours were found in Palo Pinto County, uh, which is where Mineral Wells is. And ours are indeed, I think, um, uh, Paragasiocrinus teri, just like that. And another tr little thing of them. Here we're showing, okay, a comparison of a relative that looks like Pelusocrinus and our one, which is Paragasiocrinus. And actually, it's our species, teri. And so they're comparing, so you look at this, and like, oh, okay, so it's got a little round bottom on both cases, but they have a giant bit that connects to the next row of uh, plates, whereas our next row of plates probably sit right on top. Uh, we just sort of have a little scooped out place where those could sit. And so there you can see them up there. So, all right, they're relatives. They're both living halfway buried in the ground, but uh, maybe this thing, uh, Paragasiocrinus, is a little bit more of an anchor. That's kind of interesting. And so, yeah, you just go on from there. Now, other interesting things in this paper is, look at that. This is nice. They've actually gone out and showed you the variation. So what they're saying here, variation in cone shape within a single population of the same species. So it can go from long and kind of pointy but rounded up at the top, kind of wide and sort of squat. That's right about in the middle. And you can have a really short version as well. And so what they're suggesting in the rest of the paper is that these are ecotypes, that like in a different ecosystem, it might develop one or another of these. Like if there's not much room where you can bury yourself and only a thin layer of silt on the surface, maybe it's going to grow up like this. If it's going to grow up uh, and there's just a ton of mud and it can bury itself real nicely, it might do that. If it's kind of mud where it might sink in, it might want to be a little broader so it'll sort of float like a boat on top of the mud. And so maybe you got uh, wider things like that. Who knows? Um, but uh, yeah, that's all in here. So let's go look at another paper. So that's a, a good start. And let's go back and just check out, let's see, use Google Scholar to find information on fossils of the same genus. So yeah, so we're going to keep the genus. We're not going to use these species, but we're going to read about them, learn about them, and that's going to be kind of interesting. Um, da, 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 and focus your research on where your fossil lives, so in the ocean, on the sea bottom, uh, fairly shallow, how it reproduced and what it ate. So we're going to look through these things and we're going to try and find words that describe how a thing might live or how it might hate, eat. Um, here's the other paper that I pulled up and uh, I think once again we got really lucky. And are these written? Yeah, look at that. <laughs> it's not a coincidence, these are written by the same exact dude. So. Frank Edinson, thank you very much. You've been very helpful. All right, and so this one we published a little abstract in French. You don't need to worry about that unless you read French, in which case, enjoy. And here we go. Fantastic. So we're going to go through all the words, but first I like to start with the uh, figures. And so this is great. Here we've got, ah, you'll recognize that. That's our little timeline, starting from the Cambrian. And so they're showing you all the instances of things that look like crinoids that do not seem to have a stem, that seem to be living kind of halfway buried in the dirt or sitting on the dirt or maybe swimming around, but probably not quite yet. That's probably something that comes later. <clears throat> and so we've got this early uh, bunch of them. And then it looks like they probably die out here about halfway through the Ordovician. And there's a big extinction event there, so that makes sense. And we've got these early Devonian ones, and then there's another great big extinction event. And then we've got another couple of batches that seem to finally sort of connect to each other in time. So it looks like this is a development that has occurred several times over the course of crinoid evolution. They sort of had a stem, experimented with losing the stem, all died out, and you know, it's only the ones that have a stem make it. Yeah, and so on uh, through time. The other possibility is that we just haven't found the fossils in between these uh, things and these little gaps that would uh, 
connect the lower ones to the upper ones. So the only way to figure that out is to go out and do more uh, searching. And so Rs are in definitely the late Carboniferous. So there we go. And so this is the only Paragacy of Crinus that's there. And it's talking about, OK, so it occurs in dark pro-delta shales. And so you know what a delta is. That's what Louisiana is all about. This is where the river meets the ocean. And so it looks like, and so you can read about shales, they tend to be made from little particles of mud or silt. It's usually something that a river has dropped off just at the edge of the ocean. So we're probably in shallow water. There's a lot of um, sort of dead stuff in it, uh, a lot of carbon sort of locked up in there. And uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, and then we can go through. Agrilaceous is a fancy word that means sandy. Carbonates is a fancy word that means something like a limestone. So you've got calcium carbonate binding together all the rock that's there. And these are things that uh, normally form in the ocean. You can read about those. And here we go, a short-lived transgressive seas. So for here, you want to look up not transgression the word, because you'll get a great di dictionary definition. But that won't be what you want. You want to look for uh, like Google for geology and transgression. So geology, transgression, and yeah, it goes along with regression. And there you can see that a marine transgression is an event where the sea level rises. Why would the sea level rise? Probably because all the polar ice caps have melted and dumped a whole bunch of water into the ocean. So it's not just now, it's actually happened many, 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 many times throughout geological history that, uh, yeah, the world's had a little problem. <laughs> All right, so let's go back to our little thing. And um, there's also a general discussion in here, and it's talking about the, uh, the way these things ate, the way they lived, stuff like that. Your fossil is going to be different, and what you're able to write is going to depend on what you're able to find. And so finding good references is going to be the key to your section, but I think you can do a good job with this. I think you're going to be all right. And uh, essentially, that is the section. You just want to make sure that you uh, cite your references. Now, let me show you a little trick for citing references. So let's say we get uh, this thing unattached, blah, 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 by Frank Ettenson. Let's just copy that. And if we go to a thing called Google Scholar, which is going to be your best friend, really. Uh, rather, let's search for scholar.google.com. And bam, paste it in there. There you go, it takes you to the thing. If you can find it in Google Scholar, look, there's a little quote mark down there, bam, that'll spit out the reference in MLA format or whatever the heck other format you want, or you can um, export it to um, whatever program you have to be using, uh, happen to be using, rather. And so that's great. In the text, you'd want to label this as probably reference number two. I think we used a reference number one in the previous section. And then bam, you can just drop this thing straight into the, um, the bibliography at the end of your paper, and it's going to look good. Yeah, you're going to look like you know what you're doing. So there you go. Nice little uh, easy tip to help you along. That's all I've got on this section, and uh, yeah, stay tuned if you want to, and you can check out some of the other sections. Thank you very much.